All right, so we've looked at the infinite well. <laughs> And we've seen that the energies are quantized inside this well. Now how can we physically implement such a well? One possibility is that we have a nano ribbon or a double helix like the DNA molecule and an electron is confined to exist only on this ribbon and it cannot fall off the edges. So this is one possible physical implementation of an infinite well. Another possibility is the following arrangement of plates. Suppose I have a pair of plates here and another pair of plates at some distance. Now this plate is negatively charged and this plate is positively charged. And how have these been plates? How have these plates been charged? By connecting them with a battery. <laughs> Likewise, we have a negative charge on this plate and a positive charge on this plate. And these plates have also been charged in an analogous fashion. So this is negatively charged. Yeah distant plate is positively charged. Now we have a region in between these plates where there is a negatively charged plate on the, right, on the left of this region and a negatively charged plate on the right of this region. And suppose we somehow issue an electron into this region. Now inside this region, if these plates are really large, extremely large, the potential inside this region is going to be constant and the electron will encounter a hard brick wall because it's a negatively charged plate, it will be repelled by this plate and it's going to be repelled by this plate. So the potential energy of the electron is really going to be very high as it approaches the plate. Whereas inside this region, in between the two parallel plates, the capacitor, the potential is constant. So this is one possible physical realization of creating an infinite well which has a potential landscape denoted by this. That is, at certain edges, the potential just approaches infinity. Here, the potential approaches infinity, and the particle is confined to exist only within the well. It's doomed, it's trapped forever inside the well. And we've also seen that the energy of this system is quantized. The energy is quantized because the system is bound. And we derived the quantization phenomenon. And we also argued that this confinement of the particle inside the well within these hard thick walls leads to quantization of energy. And the energy is quantized, there's some minimum energy. And then there's a next energy level, a high energy level, a high energy level, and so on. And these levels are not equally spaced. So the lowest energy level is denoted E1. The next energy level is denoted E2, which is 2 squared times E1. This energy level is denoted E3. This is 3 squared, or 9 times E1, and so on. So the spacing between these levels is not constant either. It goes up quadratically. Now, an electron, if it's trapped inside this well, it can only exist within one of these levels. It can either be the ground state, or it can be in one of the excited states. That depends upon what energy the electron has. If you somehow pull this system to its ground state, to its ultimate ground state, the electron will fall into the ground state, which is the lowest energy, which is not zero, because we have the uncertainty principle that forbids the energy to be zero. There is a minimum energy that this particle must have because you can find the particle. So this is the energy level landscape of this particle inside a well. And if I would like to draw a graph between the energy and what I now call a quantum number, n, we've seen that this small subscript n represents the quantization of the wave number. 
I know that the wave function for this particle, just the position dependent part, is given by some normalization factor 2 over L sine of n pi x over L. If I take this point to be x equals 0 and I take this point to be x equals L. This is the wave function. Now this wave function depends upon this tiny n. This n is an integer which starts from 1, goes up to infinity, 1, 2, 3, on, so on. So you have different levels. This n now could be called a quantum number. And it takes up the values 1, 2, 3, and so on. And this defines how much energy does the system have. We also know that k is quantized. k is n pi over L. So I can put a small n with k as well. k is quantized, the wavelength is quantized, which means that the wavelength has to be such that an odd, an odd integer, odd number of half wavelengths fits into this well. I'm going to draw the wave patterns again. Nevertheless, the minimum value of n is 1, and for n equals 1, there is some energy, E1. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to plot the energy n versus n. For n equals 2, the energy is 4 times E1. For n equals 3, the energy is 9 times E1. For n equals 4, the energy is 16 times E1 and so on. So the energy is now quantized. And if this electron, let me draw these energy level diagrams again. If an electron makes a transition from, say, some level n plus 1 to n, it lowers its energy by a discrete quantized amount. The lowering of energy is not arbitrary. It has to fall in, the initial and the final states have to fall on one of these steps. So it's like the runs of a ladder. You can only be on the rung of a ladder, you cannot be in between. Or you're walking up a flight of stairs, you cannot hover between two steps. You always have to remain on one of these steps. So energy becomes quantized and the electron can no longer have an arbitrary energy. It has to have one of these energies, these discrete quantized energies. And if it makes a downward transition, it lowers its energy. Since energy has to be conserved, that energy is now emitted by the system. It goes out, maybe as a photon, as a pulse of light, a packet of light, which has a precise energy, which is given by the difference in energy levels, delta E, which is now E n plus 1 minus E n. This is the energy that is now picked up by a photon that comes out of the system. Suppose, on the other hand, an electron is inside a lower energy level and you give it a pulse of energy, you input a photon. Now that photon can be absorbed or it will be transmitted. Absorbed means that the system has an energy manifold which matches the incoming energy. If the energy of the incoming photon matches one of these gaps, either this gap or this gap, or any other gap inside the system, then the photon will be absorbed. And if the photon is absorbed, for example, suppose this photon has just, it's tuned to just right, the right energy so that this upward transition can take place. This electron will go up and the photon will be absorbed. If this incoming photon doesn't have the correct energy, an energy that does not match one of these gaps, then the photon will not be absorbed, it will just be transmitted through. Alright? So, 
So this quantization of energy has profound consequences for how energy is absorbed, how energy is transmitted. If we see light coming out from a source, that light can have precise wavelengths. It can have precise frequencies or precise energies because the internal structure of that system which is emitting light is quantized. Yes? So this is our infinite well. Suppose an electron makes a transition from this level to this lower level. Now the question is, how many photons does this system emit? Does it emit a single photon or does it emit a series of photons? Now this transition actually shows that it just emits a single photon whose energy is given by this difference of energies. If the electron comes down in a successive fashion, first it comes down to this lower level, then it jumps down to the lower level, then it jumps down to the lower level, it will emit three photons, one after the other, and those photons will have frequencies corresponding to these gaps. Now the question is, if we have an electron, is it excited, it said, which of these processes does indeed occur? Whether the photon would like to come, come out as a single photon and in a single step transition or does the transition take place in multiple steps. Now, both of these transitions, these kinds of transitions are possible. But there's a higher probability that this transition is going to take place. And this is beyond the scope of this course. Uh, this process will also have some probability, but it's going to be really, really small. Anyway, now we've also seen that the wave function corresponding to these quantized energy levels is also quantized, the wavelength is quantized, and if I were to draw the wave function when the electron is in this state, that's just a half a wavelength. Correspond so this is equals 1, n equals 1 here. Now this axis which I've drawn is the x-axis and this is the length of the, of the well. Now for n equals 2, I have this wave function. For n equals 3, I have this wave function. Here two half wavelengths are fitting inside the well. Here three half wavelengths are fitting inside the well. For n equals 4, four half wavelengths, or two wavelengths are fitting inside the well. So corresponding to which state the electron is in, there are different wave functions for the electron. And these wave functions are mathematically described just by plugging in the quantum number n. Now where has this quantum number n come out from? It's come out from quantization, it's come out from confinement. You've confined the electron and the energies become quantized. If you had a free particle that wasn't confined, that had the ability to roam about anywhere in space, you did not have such a quantum number, there was no quantization. So when you wrote the wave function for a free particle, it was simply A, E, I, K, X. If I ignore the time factor, now this K could take up any value it desires. The wavelength of the free particle could be anything. That just depends upon the energy of the particle. But in this case, the energy is quantized. It can only pick up from, from a certain precise set of values. It's a finite, it's an infinite countable set of values to choose from. All right? Now what I would like to argue is, we've talked about the wave function. So what I could do is, I could also have a superposition of states. But let me, before talking about superpositions, let me talk about the time dependence. Hello. It's just that this, I have to speak very loud. 
Hello. Hello. Now, when, when we were solving the Schrodinger equation, we factored out the time part. So we have the Schrodinger equation, which is, a, in fact, a function of position and time. And we factored out the time and the spatial part. And this is the spatial part. When we solve the time independent Schrodinger equation, we acquired the spatial part, which is given by 2 over L sine n pi x over L. Now what about the time dependent part? The time dependent part comes with it. It just multiplied with the space dependent part. And what is the time dependent part? It's e raised power minus iota, the energy inside the nth state. So this is the time dependent part of the short of the wave function. So we have a spatial part, and this is the temporal part. So in one of the lectures in the previous we, we did derive, in fact, my student derived this time-dependent part. So each, each spatial part is now being multiplied with the time-dependent part. So that I have a complete snapshot of how this wave function changes both in position and in time. And this time-dependent part also depends upon the energy, the end energy. So if I'm talking about the nth wave function, I have a spatial part whose pictures I've drawn. One of these candidate pictures I've drawn for the spatial part. But what about the time dependent part? Do you understand this point? Spatial part is some of you. Up here, some of time dependent part. I said, Yeah, I'll give you some much. Who up you starting? Who up you starting? So, all right, so look up your notes and see how this time dependent part comes about. All right, so you just Separate the variables, the space and the time uh, parts are separated out, and the time dependent part gives you an equation whose solution is given like this. So, this is the complete spatio temporal wave function. Now, we would like to see how does this wave function change with time. Of course, there is time dependence. Any dynamical system must have some time dependence, it must change with time. So, we have to focus our attention on this part here. So let's take n equals 1, the ground state. In the ground state, n equals 1, so we have 2 over L under root sine of pi x over L. And if I were to draw the picture of just this part, of just this function, This is what I would obtain. So this is 0, and this is where x equals L. So for the space part, where n equals 1, for the ground state, this is the wave function. Now appended to this space part, there is a time part, which would tell me how does this wave function change with time. There is no time dependent part in this factor that I've written. So then it has to have a suffix. That suffix is the time dependent part. Now what's the energy of this, of the electron in this state it's E1? Just E1, the ground state energy, with a time factor over h bar. Now this factor captures the dynamics of this wave function. How does it change with time? Now the point is to note is that this turns out to be a real function, whereas this is a complex function. So if I were to make sense of wave functions, this entire wave function turns out to be complex. So if I would like to make sense out of it, I have to look at the real part separately. 
and the imaginary part separately. For example, I can just focus my attention on the real part of this wave function and see how it evolves with time. By the way, the probability density, if you recall, is independent of the time dependent part. Because if I look at the probability density, small p x as a function of time is just the modulus squared of this thing. But the modulus squared of this thing is just 1. So it doesn't appear in the probability density function. All right? So the probability density function If I were to plot it, it would just look like this. It would be independent of time because the, the time comes in as an exponent minus iota. So if I take the modulus square of this thing, it turns out to be 1. So the time factor does not creep into the probability density function. <coughs> but it does affect the wave function itself because the wave function does have this oscillatory factor. Whenever you have e raised per iota times something, that represents oscillation or a wave phenomenon. Just keep that in mind. Whenever you have iota in the exponent with some factor, it represents oscillation. And whatever the factor is, it must be dimensionless. It represents a phase. So the probability density, even though the wave function is time dependent, the probability de density is independent of time. Keep that in mind. So with time, the probability density remains what, just like this. It's not uniform, by the way, but it just remains this. Time passes, you keep on looking at your watch, look at the probability density, this is what the probability density is going to look like. And this probability density is going to tell you what is the possible outcome of finding an electron within the well. So there's a higher prob likelihood of finding the electron in the middle of the wave. This is what the probability density is telling you. Now let's look at the time dynamics of the wave function. Now if I just look at the real part of this, this is real, so this will always be there. What's the real part of this phase factor? It's cosine E1 T over H bar. All right, so let me just write down the real part of this factor. In fact, let me write down the entire wave function once again. So I'm going to write down the real part of the wave function. N equals 1. This is 2 over L under root sine phi x over L. Now I need to find out the real part of this thing. The real part is simply cosine E1 T over H bar. Now, I think it's quite straightforward to plot this wave function as a function of time. At time t equals 0, this thing is just 1. But as time goes up, the cosine factor is being multiplied with this thing. When time equals, when this thing equals pi by 2, which means when time equals pi over 2 into h bar over e1, this entire factor goes to 0. So this is imparting a time dynamics to the wave function. So if I, at time equals 0, if this is the wave function, as time proceeds, the wave function <coughs> changes. It decreases. Let me plot, let me first of all just plot this function as a function of time. At time equals 0, this function is 1. And this function drops with time, like a cosine. 
Then it goes negative. This is a plot of just this function, which captures and encapsulates the entire time dynamics of the total wave function. So this function starts off from 1, goes to 0, becomes negative, traverses the negative cycle, and goes to minus 1. This point, of course, is given by pi over 2 e1 h bar. When time equals this factor, then the factor, the time, the time factor goes to 0. When this time equals pi h bar over e1, this factor goes to minus 1. Now just map this course of action onto the entire wave function. Quite simple. At some advanced time, this function has dropped in its value. It's gone down. So this yellow wave function is now shrinking. At some later time, it shrinks even further. Right? So it's going down. As you go down, the multiplicative factor with the wave function is just decreasing. So the wave function keeps on shrinking. Is anything happening to the overall shape of the wave function? No. Still it has nodes on the end wall. Still it's a sine pi x over L function. It's just that the amplitude is going down. Right? And at some time, which is given by pi h bar over 2e1, the wave function goes to 0. And then it starts increasing in the negative direction. Opposite direction. It remains a sine function, sine pi x over L. It's just that its amplitude is going up and down. So time is progressing here. And then if you keep time to progress, if the clock is still ticking, this wave function is now going to oscillate up and down, but it remains like a standing wave. <clears throat> whose nodes are fixed, the position of the anti-nodes is fixed, but the amplitude is now oscillating between these extreme positions. So it's like the wave function is breathing with time. So the wave function is time dynamic, but the probability density turns out to be is, in, is independent of time. So this is how we have encapsulated time dynamics into the wave function, and this is a complete solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Yes, there's a question here. Ask this one. Just keep this to be pi by 2. <coughs> Find out what the time it corresponds to. Yes. If we uh, take a look at the pink wave function. Speak up. If we take a look at the pink wave function, uh, let's suppose it's t equal 1. Uh, it's a bit different from the yellow one. So if we take its probability, uh, it should give a lesser value than the yellow one. Uh, what do you mean? So if you take the mod if you take the modular square of this function, of course it's going to decrease. But probability density means you have to take the modular square of the entire complex wave function. Okay, and this is one. So you take the modular square of this, you don't take the modular square of that function over there. Yes, any more questions? So this is how we have incorporated time dynamics into the wave function. Now the point is that quantum mechanics is really strange. We've learned about it in quantum computing. In quantum computing, the beauty of quantum mechanics is that the state of the particle can in fact be a superposition. Right? So if I call these states, by the way, one in interesting analogy I would like to draw here is we have this quantum number n. 
Whenever you have confinement, you have contour numbers. Now this problem is one dimensional. I only have x here. I could also have y, I could also have z, I could have a three dimensional system. For example, a hydrogen atom is a three dimensional system. For a three dimensional system, you don't have one quantum number, you have three. And those three quantum numbers for the hydrogen, they are called N, L, and ML. They are exactly come out by solving the Schrodinger equation, but you need to know the potential energy of an electron inside a hydrogen atom. So if you knew that potential energy, what shape it has, what's the mathematical form it has, you can solve the Schrodinger equation and find out these wave functions. Now these wave functions are so-called eigenstates. These represent the allowed levels or the allowed orbits for the electron inside this potential landscape. So you have a two-dimensional system, you get two quantum numbers. We'll look at two-dimensional systems today. But let me talk about superpositions here in an infinite well. Now we're trying to connect with our understanding of quantum computers because we've learned that superpositions can exist. Now suppose I have psi 1x. Capital psi 1 xe. Yes. Uh, so Alright, good question. If the point was to show the imaginary part of this wave function, okay, that's a good question. So what the imaginary part is, let me try to do this. The imaginary part of this wave function is 2 over L under root sine pi x over L. Now what's the imaginary part here? With the minus sine, minus sine of p1 t over h bar. So I put a minus sign here. Sine of e1 t over h bar. Just keep in mind, this factor here is dimensionless. E over h bar is frequency. Frequency into time is dimensionless. So this is a phase. By the way, this is the imaginary part. Now, just as we've drawn the real part, we can draw the imaginary part. The real part is not more real than the imaginary part. Keep that in mind. You could either choose to plot the real part, or you could choose to plot the imaginary part. The real is not more real than the imaginary. There's nothing special about the real. You can choose either part you like. So if I were to plot this imaginary part, you'll get the same time dynamics. Let me plot the imaginary part. But before that, I need to plot the sine function. So if I plot the sine function as a function of time, it starts off by 0, goes up, comes down, and just keeps its eternal cycle going on and on. So now I have to multiply this function with this modulation factor. This is a modulation factor. This is a multiplicative factor. This factor has to be multiplied to this albeit with a negative sign. So if I were to plot the imaginary part of the wave function and its time course, at time t equals 0, this function is 0. So 0 is being multiplied by this, I get 0. As time goes up, this factor goes up, so this factor goes up, this is just a sine function in space, but there's a negative sign here, so as time progresses, my wave function goes negative. And it keeps on going negative. And then it starts to drop. So here, after this point onwards, this sign 
his multiplicative fraction starts to decrease. And it's becoming, there's a negative sign here, so it decreases, this function becomes less negative. So it breathes down, then it comes back up again. It comes back up again, goes up, and still it's like a standing wave, and then it starts progressing in the opposite direction. So exactly the same breathing dynamics of this ground state wave function are observed. Okay? So the time dynamics is still the same. And you can actually observe that the real and the imaginary parts are 90 degrees out of phase. Because the sine and the cosine are 90 degrees out of phase. When this is positive maximum, this is zero. When this goes to zero, this goes to minus its maximum or its minimum. And so on. So there's a 90 degree phase difference between the real and the imaginary parts. But what is important physically for an experimenter, what you observe is nothing but this sedentary, stationary, probability density function that doesn't change the time. Okay? So from an experimenter's point of view, this is what matters. But the wave functions do matter because if you want to do quantum computing or you would like to do interference, you would like to have superpositions, an understanding of the wave functions is actually important. Okay, so now I can actually show this on a simulation. What I've done on a blackboard, it, it should also be shown on a simulation, it's no problem. Yes. Uh, no. They are the same wave functions. Alright, let me show you something on, on simulation. Exactly the same thing. The simulation just takes two minutes and it doesn't give you the exact flavor, the exact concept, but nevertheless. Function as you might 
recall. Now if I were to take the second state, which is the first excited state, I put a1 equals 0 and I put a2 equals 1. Let's see what do I get. So I halt this simulation, I pause it, I make time go back to 0, I make a1 go to 0, I make a2 go to 1. Now this is the first excited state, n equals 2. And we all know that this is the wave function. This is what it looks like. It has two half wavelengths inside the well. The imaginary part is 0. So I will have 2 pi x here, here, 2 pi x, and the same factor here with e2. Now remember, e2 is higher. e2 is higher. So the frequency with which this wave oscillates, the standing wave change is going to be different. It's going to be four times higher than the frequency of the n equals one state. The frequency of this oscillation, the breathing mode, is going to be slightly faster. Keep that thing in mind. Okay? So this is the first excited state. This is the probability density, like a two-hump camel. <coughs> Now nothing is going to happen to the probability density function because this is also a stationary state and you will have oscillations of this wave function between the two extremes just like a standing wave with four times the energy of the ground state. Energy is actually telling us the frequency of oscillation and K is telling us how many wavelengths fit into the infinite well. Okay, just these notions will last with you forever. Energy tells you how fast this object is changing. And K is actually telling us how rapidly in space does the wave function turn. How wiggly is the wave function in space. Let's run the simulation. So it's slightly faster as you can observe than the previous example. We have nodes at the <coughs> walls. We always have a node at the center. The position of the nodes doesn't change because it's not a traveling wave. It's a standing wave. The position of the anti-nodes doesn't change. If I had the second excited state, which corresponds to n equals 3. <clears throat> so this is what you're starting off with. At time t equals 0, you have three half wavelengths inside the well. Now as time progresses, exactly the same pattern will be observed. Remember, if n equals really large, you have more and more wiggles inside the well. So, you approach a classical description. Because then, you do not have the resolution that's good enough to resolve between the crest and the shaft. Everything looks classical. This, by the way, is called the correspondence principle. So, if n equals 2, let's see what the time dynamics is going to look like. Nothing happens to the probability density function. It remains like a stationary wave. All right, now let's take a 10 minute break and we'll proceed with a two dimensional example.